Well, good evening once again. Have you ever heard somebody or people sort of suggest like you can kind of divide the world in, in two groups? I'll say like there's two, there's two kinds of people in the world. Um, there's either like a, a Mac person or a PC person. Like you've heard people do this, right? Like they kind of suggest like there's, there's two ways of doing things. Or like there's Chicago style deep dish person or a thin crust person, um, which I would contest that, by the way. I, I feel favorable about all pizza. Um, there's like the people that, that roll the toilet paper so it rolls forward, and then there's the people that roll the toilet paper so it rolls backwards. There's dog people and cat people, or there are Coke people and Pepsi people, or in Chicago there's Cubs fans, or White Sox fans, or happy people, or sad people, just uh, in the <laughs> case. Um, and, and we do this sort of thing. I've even like, went online just this week looking at this. There's like online quizzes you can take to see kind of like what, what sort of person you are. And I've actually even done like a full scale kind of personality test. I don't know if you've done one of these before, but it, it basically gives you a series of the same sorts of of questions and forces you to make a choice, which was didn't, by, by nature did not come easy to me. Like I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, well, I'm sort of in the middle or I'm a 3.5 on a scale. You know, like I, I could not just, it was very difficult for me to choose one or the other, but based on the choices that you make, it spits out all sort of information about, about your personality and your wiring and your giftedness and your temperament and, and all of these sorts of things. And today, we are wrapping up our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're coming to the conclusion of this text, and in and, and, and this portion that we're about to read, Jesus essentially says there's two kinds of people. There's two kinds of people. By the way, I want to just, on a side note here, if I can, I know in the announcements it, it commented on the upcoming series that begins next week entitled The Art of Neighboring. I really would strongly encourage you all to be here over the next three weeks as, as we study this together. Uh, uh, next week, as Pastor Jeff launches this series together, I think it's really going to be instructive and helpful as we continue to think about this vision of being a family of neighborhood churches that are committed to seeing lives transform and, and, and the world impacted through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So just by way of a commercial here, I want to invite you to be here with us as we begin this new series, as we lay this foundation for this vision that we believe God is giving us as a church. I really think it's going to be important. Um, but back to our text. As, as we're wrapping this up, as we're thinking about what Jesus is teaching us, he comes to this final sort of portion of the Sermon on the Mount and he looks at those who have gathered around him, and he essentially says to them, there, there are two kinds of people, and you are one or the other. If you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick up where Pastor Brian was kind of focusing on a few weeks ago as he was talking about um, the, the, the wide road and the narrow. We're going to start there. We're going to work our way through the end of, of the chapter. So this is Matthew 7, beginning in verse 13. It says, Now enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came. And when the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Jesus now wraps up the Sermon on the Mount here with this this series of metaphors that ultimately seek to delineate to to make the distinction between life in the kingdom of God and life in the kingdom of this world. And throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, and we've been talking about this almost every week, I feel like there's this danger of being redundant, but this is what Jesus has been going after. He has been making the distinction, showing the contrast between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God all throughout Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But now he seems to make it personal. Now now he seems to be coming at this with a degree of urgency. And he drives at the heart of the matter for his disciples and for the crowds that have gathered to hear him teach. He drives at the heart of the matter for the the religious establishment who who are paying attention to his every word. In doing all of this now, Jesus Jesus points us to both a warning, he makes us aware of of what's at stake, but then he also also brings us to the point where, where we are looking at life in the kingdom and life outside the kingdom, and there is a a call to action, a need for a response to this invitation that Jesus has been given extending to this description of the kingdom of God that that he's been inviting us into, that he wants us to participate in. So let's take a few moments to to work our way through this text together. And I want to begin by by highlighting the contrast. I want to begin by highlighting the contrast. Again, I feel like there's this is a little bit redundant, but but Jesus is so he emphasizes this point. As we look at this text, I, there's this inherent emphasis that is present here. Jesus uses three consecutive metaphors now to make his point. There, there's this urgency that he has as, as he is sharing this with those who are listening to him, as if Jesus is ultimately saying, I, I want to make sure that you don't miss this. I want to make sure that, that you get this above all else. Remember in Luke chapter 15, when Jesus is, is using parables in order to explain the heart of the Father for the lost? There again, he does it three times, right? He's, he's like, the, the heart of the Father for the lost could be described as, as a shepherd going after a lost sheep. It could be described as, as a woman who turns her house upside down in order to find a lost coin. It could be described as a father who stands and watches for the return of his lost son. Jesus wanted to make sure that we got that, and so he repeated it in various ways in order to understand how much his heart bleeds for the lost. Again, now Jesus does something very similar. He uses three different metaphors. He says there's two gates and two roads. There's there's two trees, a good tree and a bad tree. There's two houses One that is solid on the rock and the other that is built on the sand. And in doing all of this, he's saying there's two kinds of people. There's two kinds of people and we are either one or the other. As Jesus is presenting this, as we enter into these words, Jesus now ultimately brings us into a moment of truth. 
He brings us to a moment of truth. Jesus, as, as this contrast is being presented between life in the kingdom of God and, and life outside of the kingdom of God, he does this for, I think, an essential and vital reason. In order to invite us, to force us, perhaps, to, to understand or to consider or to evaluate where we're at. He does this, he brings us to this moment of truth in order to force us to ask the question and to answer the question, where do I stand? There's two roads, there's, there's two trees, there's, there's two houses, and all of this brings us to the question, where is our standing? Jesus ultimately says, and, and again, this is inherent throughout the Sermon on the Mount, but he ultimately says there's, there's two ways of doing things. There's two ways to approach life. There's the predominant, uh, uh, common, widely accepted view that is some sort of variation of religion, right? It, it is some sort of idea that says, I will store up a good record in front of God. I will, I will present this impressive resume to him. And then God will be forced to find me acceptable. God, in return, because of all the good things that I have done, God, God will then, in return, do good things for me. If you break down, if you break down every world religion outside of the gospel, every world religion is some variation of that story, that worldview, that philosophy, that idea. It gets packaged differently, it gets presented differently, but at its core, that's what it's about. Jesus says there's a wide road. This, this is the dominant way of thinking, the dominant way of perceiving how you would relate to God. But Jesus says in contrast to then, this, this is what we'll call the gospel. This is what I am ushering in. This is, this is life in the kingdom of God, which essentially says you can do nothing. There's nothing in and of myself that I can do in order to make myself acceptable before a holy God. There's nothing that I bring him that can impress him and say, God, you should accept me because look at my credentials. Look at the things that I've done that, that should warrant your favor, that should warrant your grace instead god says let me project let me give to you my perfection let me let me bestow on you my righteousness and then i will call you son or daughter i will i will look at you and say you are accepted i will say you are a new creation not because of the effort that you put in to achieve this but because of what he's done to give it to us. And then, as a result, and, and as a result of all of this, then I give my life to him. Because of what he's done for me, Jesus says, this is the narrow road. It's an entirely different way of thinking. This is the, the firm foundation, a house built on a rock. Jesus, in this text, he gives us three stark, contrast three very different perspectives and he does so in order to enable us or really perhaps said better in order to free us to be able to consider which which system which operating system are we functioning under are we functioning in the dominant the, the uh, uh, dominant view that says do enough good be good enough or out good the person next to you and so god will find you acceptable are we living in the view that says i i am unacceptable but i place my faith in jesus christ and he makes me acceptable and so i live for him this is what jesus is bringing us to this place of of discernment where we are forced to kind of deal with these questions which road am I on? Am I, am I on the wide road or the narrow road? Notice Jesus leaves no in-between. He leaves no third option. Am I experiencing the kind of heart transformation that bears good fruit? Or am I buying into this faulty system of the world that promises life but always fails to deliver? Meaning when he's talking there about 
about the false prophets. He says, who are you listening to? And do their lives match up with everything that we've been talking about? Do they bear good fruit? Or do they bear diseased fruit? Jesus says, what is your foundation built on? Is it built on solid rock that is sure to stand, that can weather the storms? Or is it built on something else that might seem sturdy in the moment, but will crumble in the uncertainty of the floods? Jesus says there are one, you are one of, of these two realities. You are either in one of these two places. There's nothing in between, and Jesus brings us to this moment of truth. And in all of this, as Jesus is, is offering up these contrasts, in the midst of each one of these stark contrasts, then Jesus offers us a warning. He shows us a warning that goes along with each one of this. And I think this is one of the most powerful aspects of this passage for me. Because I think therein we are capturing something of the heart of, of God. It reveals the heart of Jesus to the urgency behind his message isn't based on, on some sort of restriction that he wants to place in our life or some sort of limit that he wants to uh, give us in terms of the amount of fun that we can have. He isn't withholding something from us. Jesus here in these warnings, he shows us rather just the opposite, that his motivation is to protect to, to give life and to deliver us to something better. Listen once again to these warnings. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. It says every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and, and thrown into the fire. In verse 27, it says, And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat against the house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus is saying, I can see where the system of this world leads us. I can see where this story ends. I can see where it takes us, and, and I can see the harm that is done. And I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to experience that. I don't want you to be found in that place. I feel like this is like a, a, a parent of a two-year-old, right? Right? So you think about, if you've ever had a two-year-old in your home, how they're just this rambunctious, like, uh, take-on-anything sort of life that they live, and yet as a parent, you're constantly running around putting up gates and sticking things and, and plastic things in sockets and because you know where it ends, right? You know that when they're standing there with their little tricycle on top of the deck heading towards the stairs, it doesn't end well. Right? We know that as parents, and so we're constantly running around putting things in place, helping them understand, don't go there. Like, this is going to end bad. This is going to hurt. You're going to experience pain. I think this captures something of what Jesus is trying to get through to us as he shares this. I don't want you to go there. This doesn't end well. This ends poorly for you. I have something better. And so he delivers along each one of these contrasts a warning that goes with it. And then in the middle of this, I don't know if you caught this or not, in the middle of this, there's this, this unnerving warning that's sort of disconnected from, from the three metaphors that we see here in the text. If you look back at, uh, at chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, he says this, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Just prior to this, now Jesus has, has given them instruction using the, the two trees metaphors about how to be careful about false prophets or false teachers. Teachers that would, that would teach religion and not gospel. And now Jesus says, I want, you to be, I want you to be careful about becoming a false disciple, a false follower. I mean, what are we to make of these verses? Look at the description of the people that Jesus is speaking to. It's, it's impressive. Like he says to them, 
that, that they, they said, we did these things in the name of Jesus. They referred to him as Lord, Lord, saying that they understood who he is. They're doing ministry. It says, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Aren't we prophesying or speaking truth in your name? Aren't we, aren't we doing miracles in your name? Like you would look at this group of people and you say, certainly this is, these people are in the, on the narrow road. And Jesus says, he looks at them in spite of all of this. Jesus says to them on that day, which that, when you see that phrase, on that day in scripture, that is a reference to the day of judgment. So Jesus says to them on that day, depart from me for I never knew you. Why? Why would Jesus say that to this group of people? Because he's just giving us one more example of those who are on the wide road, of those who are depending on some variation of a spiritual record in order to earn a status of acceptable in front of a holy God. Look, what they're, look at the case they make before Jesus. They say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do mighty works in your name? Look at what we did, Jesus. Look at all the things that we did. And somehow in the midst of all of that, everything that they've accomplished, everything that they've done, they somehow failed to see and understand what Jesus did for them. And he's saying it's just, it's just another variation of, of religion. It's just another variation of you trying to earn your way in front of a holy God. And he says, depart from me. For I never knew you. There's this, there's this harsh warning that we have to take heart of in the church to make sure that the gospel that we preach never starts to become a message of, of elevating that which we do ahead of that which he has done for us. One is primary. The other flows out of it. It's always about what Jesus has done for us. And this brings us back to the central thrust of this text. Because the primary point of all of this is that this is about Jesus. That Jesus is the narrow gate. That Jesus is the firm foundation. The sand that's referred to there in those verses, that's anything else. That's everything else that you would seek to build your life on, your case on, your ability to be found acceptable in front of God. Anything outside of Jesus is just sand. And Jesus is saying, where did you build your house? John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that we know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Lastly, then, Jesus, I think powerfully so, brings us to a point of a decision. He brings us to a point of a decision. The stark contrast that he gives us and the warnings that come along with us do not leave us in a place of neutrality. It doesn't leave that as an option. It doesn't give us the, the ability to say, well, both of those sound good. Jesus is, is bringing us, forcing us into this place of, of, of a decision. He says in verse 20, Lord, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then further down in verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. What does he mean? Hear these words of mine and do them. To, to be found in him. To, to be made acceptable through him, to receive that which he has come to give us. He's saying those that hear this and do this, this is, goes all the way back to the Beatitudes. He's talking about those who are poor in spirit and he calls them blessed. Why? Because they are hearing the message of Jesus and they're the ones saying, I want that. I want that. I need that in my life. Their life is hard and Jesus says, you're blessed. Jesus says those that that hear these words and do them. They receive them. They take them in. They enter into this kingdom life that Jesus has been describing. It says your house is built on the firm foundation. Again, the context here, that those verses flow immediately out of Jesus describing this interaction on the day of judgment. He's saying the foundation, what will your foundation be when you stand in front of him? Because we'll be one of two people. Will it be the person who says, the only claim that I have in front of you 
is the grace of Jesus Christ. Or I'll be one of those people that says, but didn't I do this? And didn't I do this? And didn't I do this? I'll either stand on the rock that is Jesus, or I will stand on my own efforts. One will be found acceptable, and he'll say, enter in, come be with me. The other one, he'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. This text that we're looking at brings us, it forces us to come to a place of decision. He leaves no neutral ground, no in-between. And, and, and this is not just vital in, in those moments when, when we understand Jesus as our Savior. That's obviously essential and critical and, 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 and uh, primary in the text. But I would also point out that there is words for us who, who, who have given our lives to Christ and yet who would start to take back the life that I live and kind of re-sort of orient my back into that religious sort of way of doing things. I'm, I'm going to prove myself to God by all the things that I do. My wife and I were talking about this just, just the other day and we're saying, well, how do we know? How do we know when I'm doing stuff because of what Jesus has done for me or, or I'm doing stuff because I'm trying to impress Jesus. I think the passage gives us a few litmus tests as it's talking about bearing good fruit and, and other things like that. But the question that keeps coming to my mind as I evaluate my own propensity to sort of want to navigate back to the religion thing, to go back there and say, but God, look, look at these things I've done. You, you should find me acceptable because of all this great stuff I'm doing for you, is to ask the question, why? Like, why am I doing this? Is this out of some need to make myself acceptable to him? Or am I doing this because I've already been made acceptable in Jesus? And this is just a form of worship. This is just a form of, of response to saying, look what God has done for me. I'm going to live my life for him. That, that is what Jesus is calling us to. That is what he's offering. That is the invitation that he extends. That's the decision that he leaves in front of us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we have had the opportunity this summer to explore your word and your teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And God, throughout all of it, you have made this, this distinction between a life apart from you, a life built on our own effort, and the life that is available to us in the gospel. So Jesus, we pray today that we would be found in you. Lord, that we would be on the narrow road that we would listen to those who are bearing good fruit, that, that our house would be built on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That would be our claim. And Lord, out of a life that is found anew in you, that we live in worship of a holy God who calls us his sons and daughters. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.